Instagram and Twitter, Snapchat, Vanish Today. What else would you have? through it yeah, we're gonna go through the motions all right uh, so no one said action th there's no action we're just kind of I, I was waiting on my cue all right oh you thought this was professional <laughs> masika you should know us by now I should, I should know i definitely should so you grew up in chicago i did born and raised um south side of chicago i went to school in chicago heights um and i grew up like in a black neighborhood black inner city neighborhood I went to school in a Mexican neighborhood with all of the rich white drug addict children. So I kind of got <laughs> a mix of every dynamic um, in one day as a kid. And was it a poor neighborhood? Was it a rich neighborhood? Or I don't know how that works um, out. I would say lower middle class. I don't know if it was a poor neighborhood. I know we were poor, <laughs> but I didn't know we were poor as a kid. Um, I had fun. I had everything I thought I wanted, thought I needed. I didn't realize till I got older. Oh, shit. We were poor. I've had the pleasure of meeting your mom several, several times, and I love that woman to yeah, death. Yeah, thank you. And she said that her idol is Robert Kiyosaki. So that's, <laughs> you know, coming Rich from, Dad, uh, you know, from your mother and your stories and everything we've talked about, you know, Robert Kiyosaki sounds, stands for, you know, investing in yourself, investing in properties and marketing and everything about elevating somebody's uh, self. And, and becoming, um, you know, independent and wealthy. You yeah. know, has any of that rubbed off on you? Oh, absolutely. You know, the thing with my parents, you know, my mom's father owned several businesses. He had a record shop, he had a barbecue place and things like that. So as a child, she would go to work with him and like help him run the register. So she saw that very early on. And uh, he was very frugal and he penny pinched a whole lot. You know, he might have $300 in coins sitting in his trunk you know, at, at any given time, because he always, you know, saved everything, and, um, you know, he was, he was, he was not generous, so, you know, she learned a lot from him, um, you know, my parents got married very young, 18, 21, they didn't know much of anything, my dad went to the Air Force pretty early, and, you know, my mom always tried to teach us about, you know, be a business owner and do these things, but we didn't have the capital to do it. So, you know, I remember my mom watching like Susie Orman and things like that. I'm like, oh my God, this is boring. But, you know, my mom, she always had that ambition and aspiration and tried to always teach us to be our own bosses. But again, you know, we learned about it, but I didn't really see it. So I didn't really know how to get started or anything like that. I didn't have any money. Um, when I was 18, I came to L.A. for the first time to visit, and that was the first time that I saw black people having money and living well and having nice cars and nice houses and things like that. And it was crazy because I really didn't know that was possible. Like, you know, you never see it, so you don't think about it. That's kind of when I realized I wanted something different. I wanted something better. And um, I didn't know how to get it. But yeah. you moved from Chicago to Atlanta. And yes. you found out that, hey, you could do uh, music videos, make a lot of money from it. At what point did you find that you started to become that brand? Masika Kalisha was a brand. Yeah. So um, in Chicago, my parents had us in like acting and things like that. And believe it or not, I was shy. No one believes that. Um, so I would always do great on my auditions, but they'd always say, she doesn't want to talk to us. Like, she'll answer the question directly and that's it. Like, how are you? Fine. You know, it was never like, oh, I'm fine. How are you? Today was a So I, I just, I didn't want to do it. So I'd ask my parents to take me out. Um, we moved to Atlanta when I was still in high school. And um, my parents kicked me out <laughs> when I was uh, 17. And, you know, kind of tried to figure it out on my own. So I kind of went from not being allowed to drive. I wasn't allowed to talk to boys on the phone. I wasn't allowed to do anything. To all of a sudden now I'm thrown out in the world. And I really had to figure it out really quickly um I, and why did they do that why did your parents kick oh you out oh god it's such a i don't even want to tell this were story. you out of control you're shy not. but no. now you're out of control what no you're getting bad grades no you're really smart I, I i've come to terms with it as an adult and kind of like made up my own reasons now that i'm a parent um i think and i could be wrong i think my parents were trying to teach me a lesson thinking that it would shock me and shake me up and i'd come back home but i never went back so you're on your own on my own trying to figure it out i ended up staying in the basement of uh, the the guy I was dating house at the time. He lived with his parents and five kids. 
And you stayed in the basement with I your boyfriend? Their, I stayed in their basement for two months. Um, got three jobs till I got enough money to get my own place. Got my own place, got my own car. I was in college. Um, you know, I had a 4.0 initially. And it was like, okay, I work and make money and pay my bills and great slip. Or I, you know, study real hard, miss work, and I'm broke. So it got to the point where I'm like, you know what? College ain't for me. I'm not trying to be the broke, struggling college student. I'm out. So how did you become successful? How did that all work out? I mean, here you are. You're in Atlanta. You're living in your boyfriend's basement. Wait, that was two months. I had my own place now at this hey. point. I had a townhouse uh, right behind the Georgia Terrace. And I, I was there for a little bit. I had a condo in Atlanta Station so you broke for a little bit. Him. You broke up with your boyfriend. Yeah. Now, now, now you're living by yourself? Mm-hmm. And he said, hey, I'm not going to live in the basement with you no more. <laughs> no, it wasn't living in the basement with him. I mean, I had nowhere to go. And his parents were nice enough to, you know, help me. Yeah. I was waitressing at Gladys Knight's Chicken and Waffles. And uh, this guy. Gladys Knight's Chicken yeah. Waffles. What is that? It's, it was Gladys Knight's restaurant. It's like Roscoe's here, but it's Gladys Knight's. Um, Did she ever come in? Yeah. And at the restaurant, they always put celebrities on the wall, like pictures of celebrities that would come in. And I always tell them one day my picture's going to be on that wall. One day it's going to be on the wall. And, you know, I had no idea how that was going to happen. I was just, you know, speaking faith. And um, I had two customers come in. It was these two guys, two black guys. And this one guy was like, oh, you're beautiful. You should be a model. Da, da, da. I'm like, whatever. And we actually exchanged information. And he had like a marketing company and blah, blah, blah. I don't know. I ended up coming to L.A. He paid me like 1500 bucks to do the shoot. And at that time, I was like, $1,500. That's amazing, you know? So, you know, he picked me up in like an Ashton Martin, put me up at the Lara Montage, which then was like, the place and you know there was a Rolls Royce downstairs and a this downstairs he's like there's cars at the valet take your pick and I'm like what what the hell is going on here and you drop your um, boyfriend. huh what'd you say? <laughs> say you drop your boyfriend I did when I came back I surely did because <laughs> at that point I used to like like tall light skinned model looking boys that were like broke and um coming to LA with him you know and seeing a different lifestyle that you know some of these roughneck rugged drug dealer looking guys are the ones that, that have all the power. I was like, ooh, yeah, I like that. So, you know, when I came back to Atlanta waitressing, I saw something that was like a, they were looking for extras for the movie ATL. So I was like, oh, that'd be fun. I'll go on set one day. And I had never been on a set at that point. So I, I waited for my off day and I went up there to be an extra and I got there a little late. And when I got there, there was like a line of girls. Like I don't, it was like a hundred girls just standing in a line and someone was like standing in line. I didn't even know what, what it was for. They had Chris Robinson on one of the dollies and uh, they were sliding him down the line. He was like sitting on the dolly, like going down the line, looking at the girls. And I was like, what? this is weird. So he gets, I'm on the end. He's like her, get her, get her in hair and makeup. So they take me to hair and makeup and they start like taking off clothes, and putting on clothes and doing this to my hair. And I'm like, what the hell's going on? So I don't even know what's happening. Then they walk me to this area where the set is. And again, I never been on set. So they take me in the middle of the circle. Big boy walks up and he has a cigar and he's like a, some cognac and they like introduce him to me and they're like okay he's like all right everybody ready okay you know background action and action. and i'm like wait what am i doing and they're like nobody told her to breathe her what's going on so they they wanted me to kiss him and i had never been on camera before ever i had never like you know met really much of, i mean just like customers like ball players and stuff that come in, came in the restaurant but i never really knew anyone so i was like wow this is my first time ever filming anything in front of all these people and i gotta kiss this man who's smoking a cigar and drinking cognac it's gonna be great so they wanted me to play his girlfriend but i didn't speak and i didn't know the difference between an extra featured extra stand in back i didn't know any of that at that point so I didn't realize that they didn't want me to talk because they would have had to pay me more. So I was like big boy's mute girlfriend for half the movie. And then I was super excited when the movie um, came out because I was like, I was so excited to see my part. They put like a picture of me in the bit in the ad. I was like, oh, it looks so cute. Movie comes, I'm nowhere to be found. They edited the whole thing out. I was like, is that something? You were in ATL? No, I was, <laughs> I was I'm in the ATL, <laughs> edited. The uh, the, the, I'm, I'm on the cutting room floor of ATO. I think you might see me in a background here and there, but like I said, I ended up, I didn't know the other difference. So I ended up working on that film for most of the summer. Um, and just kind of even days that I wasn't working, they let me be a stand in or extra. And I met a lot of casting directors. I met Jazzy Faye, who's now my daughter's godfather. I met T.I., who I'm, you know, been great friends with T.I. and Tamika for years. And that's kind of the set where I started meeting all of these people. Um, and so the day we wrapped, I was booked for Big Tigger's Kitten's Calendar, which was like the big thing back then. Flew to Miami and did that. Came back to Atlanta, met 
all the well I met all the big casting directors at on set so I got booked for a TI video that was my first video then Trillville then Nelly and it just kind of started taking off it was literally like back to back um you know I realized okay in one day I can make a thousand to three thousand dollars where it takes me two to three weeks to do that waiting tables and it just got to the point where I was making so much money that I quit my job and I was able to do you know a lot of things I wanted to do um I kind of got a little comfortable because it was like I was making so much money at 19 I got a two-bedroom condo condo at the 12 which was like the, before all the drug dealers and scammers moved in it was really hard to get in there <laughs> um you know I had my little bins you can't tell me nothing um and then you know still wanting to move to LA but it's like I was comfortable so I was a big fish in a small pond at that point. It was like scary to move to L.A. Before I moved here, I kind of set some roots, um, you know, got with a bunch of casting directors that I made sure knew me. So they kept booking me. I got a bottle service job at a little club in West Hollywood that no one would know I worked at. So two days a week, I know at least I can make a couple thousand dollars, um, you know, just kind of set the foundation. And uh, not a couple months after I'd been here, I, got, I saw it right up. Um, on Boss Up for Love and Hip Hop coming to LA. And I looked at that, I was like, I would never do this show. And uh, two of my girlfriends sent me a screenshot, like, bitch, you better get on the show, that's gonna be you. I'm like, I would never in a million years do that show. Let me let me call somebody and see if I can get on the show. <laughs> you know, because at first it's like, ugh, I wouldn't do that. But then I thought about it. I'd rather be a working actor than acting like I'm working. So I was like, who do I know that can get me on? At the time, there was this guy named Ernest, um, that worked on the set of a show that I... The PR person, Ernest? Yeah. Oh. He, he was a PA for James Debeau. James Debeau is the one that produced um, Comic View and all these other shows. And at the time, he had a show for um, Playboy. Playboy was trying to turn their network into something more like Showtime or whatever. So um, there was a show that he produced that I was on that was similar to... It was very similar to Power, like that type deal. And Ernest again was like a, his his assistant so after we wrapped on that show I saw Ernest with some of the reality girls and I'm like oh he's doing PR now so I reached out to him like hey you know could you get me an interview blah, blah blah he was like sure I know one of the EPs send me some juicy stuff so I sent him a series of text messages from a couple of your favorite rappers favorite artists whatever and like that kind of intertwined to this crazy story and he sent it over they're like she's crazy let's talk to her um so I got a meeting with Mona Next day, I got an offer. Um, so, you know, that's kind of how I ended up on Love & Hip Hop. You moved to LA, and here you are hitting, hitting the screen. Right. I mean, honestly, I was like, shit, I made it great. I'm about to be famous. Money's up to rolling in. No. Um, I didn't know. Like, there were so many things I didn't know. I didn't have a publicist initially. I didn't have a manager. I didn't have, like, all these things. You know, people think you get on TV, and phew, that's it. No, you have to know the legal things. Like there was records that I wanted to do, you know, and put out. And I'm like, okay, great. I have this platform, with a million plus viewers. I can put out a record and go platinum easy. Great. Didn't realize, you know, that I needed the TV split sheets and the music split sheets and this and that. You know, so like there's a deadline to get those done by each episode. And again, I didn't have the right manager, or the right team or things like that. And I had so many people that were begging to do records with me because they wanted to be on TV. So it's like, hey, here's the split sheets, da da da. I'm like, first of all, I didn't know what a split sheet was. Then it's like, oh, okay, cool. So they explain it to you and then you send it to the producer or whoever you wrote with. Then here comes the, oh yeah, I'm gonna need 10 million, billion dollars to sign this. You know, so it was like all of these people that were like trying to black belt, blackmail me and like, you know, see what they could get because now I'm on TV and they think, well, shoot, she's rich now. And, you know, so it was like there's, I lost a lot of opportunities. There's a lot of records that I couldn't get on the show or miss out on or miss deadlines on or, you know, that just, I'm like, wow, I, I didn't, I didn't know that. So it was like all this time, wait, I spent hours in the studio, you know, writing and doing these sessions. Now I can't even use these records because these people think, that they're gonna get famous now or get rich off of me so they're blackmailing me didn't know any of that then you know i, I quit season two because i didn't like how they were trying to portray me they you wanted me you can quit a tv show i thought i could oh could it let's go into that yeah so you know i didn't like how they were portraying me they wanted me to be this hoe so bad and everybody side check and it was just like this, none of the none of the stories were true mona comes calling well she didn't call actually i got a contract no phone call, no email, no nothing. They emailed a contract to Ernest and my old 
um, attorney, neither who I was working with. Didn't even call. I was like, oh, I, so you eat, so you don't even say anything. You just send a contract here, bring her back. No, I'm not coming back. I don't want to come back. So, you know, I went back and forth with the producers and everybody called me but Mona. And I was like, no, like, why hasn't she called me? Mona needs to call me. That's crazy. Like, you don't just send me a contract. So finally get the call from Mona. And, you know, I told her, well, I'm doing my own show and blah, 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 blah. And then she politely let me know, that's cute. You can't do it. You have an attorney at the time? Um, I did. <laughs> so I had hired three attorneys. I'm not going to say their names, but they were three of the like biggest name attorneys in like entertainment law and they had all the reality stars. And you should were, have been fine then. You should have been, right? They were at the biggest firms and like they had when I say all the top girls, all the top girls, I'm thinking, I hired the best attorneys. Like they have all the girls, they're gonna give me the best deals. And I remember, you know, I came back season three and I was miserable. Season four, I I wanted to literally just never come to work and I was trying to figure out how do I get out my contract I was depressed upset I hated every day at work and they were literally anti antagonizing me they were they were dragging me through the mud because I didn't want to cooperate with their fake storyline um I was a mother now so all the stuff I was willing to do I'm not I told them my child is off limits anything that has to do with her that can negatively affect her that she can see one day I'm not going to do and they refused to respect my wishes so I refused to do it um you know I talked to my attorney at the time I need to get out my contract how can you help can you help he sent a request they ignored him then you know I got he said something whatever I called Mona and told her like listen you know I just want to let you know I had my attorney request my release and I just wanted to, you know, I appreciate the opportunity, blah, blah, blah. But I didn't want you to find out via email. I want to talk to you. She was like, yeah, I know they told me. But, you know, I don't know. Nobody's gotten out of this contract um, early. So you can, you know, sit out to the end of the till period. Again, I was told it's here and today. So I'm like, whatever. So I was really stressed out. I was on the phone with my attorney. And I was like, I got to go. We had literally just had this conversation about getting my release. And he was like, let me see what I can do. I'm going to try, I'm going to try, I'm going to try. And um, I, I was like, I have to go to dinner. So I hung up with him and I went to Boa. And I'm walking out of Boa, and boom, I run into my attorney, like literally almost smacked him in the face. I'm like, what are you doing here? He's like, oh, hi, hey, hi. Um, um, yeah, I'm, uh, ah, funny thing, I'm having dinner with your uh, soon-to-be former boss. It's more just Christmas dinner. I'm like, excuse me? <laughs> and he's like, yeah, yeah, you want to go say hi? I was like, absolutely. And I walk out to the courtyard, and it's Mona and all of the producers of the show, and pretty much the whole staff having a Christmas dinner. And it just clicked. He's in cahoots with the network. Why would I think that these attorneys that have all the reality stars are gonna be fighting for us? They're probably on some type of payroll, so get some type of bonuses or some type of incentive to keep us in these BS contracts. But after hiring an attorney that actually read contracts and knew the laws, um, you know, it worked out. Michael Heikland is my attorney, and um, they actually told him when I changed attorneys, you know, she can quit, but she's going to sit. We're never going to let her go to a competing show, and that didn't end very well for them. So, you know, it's not about what you can, what your offer is about what you can negotiate. Um, so, thankfully, I was able to get out that season and move on to another show and other opportunities that I would have never been able to get had I stayed with the wrong team. Okay, outside of work, what's your dating life like? Uh, hmm, let's see. Between my text messages, DMs, and other things, uh, let's say, I would say it looks like Summer Jam backstage, um, Super Bowl, and the playoffs. Uh, <laughs> what does that mean? A lot of thought leads, a lot of rappers, singers. Uh, you know, usually it's all of the blue check losers that are always like you know trying to get your attention and they feel like because of who they are they don't have to do much um so that's usually who ends up approaching me and every now and then i'll end up giving one like an opportunity to fuck up um <laughs> what is your type masika i'm attracted to power i like powerful men um i you know i feel like at a certain age a physical description is childish like i don't care what you look like, I care what you can do. I'm pretty enough for the both of us. Um, I actually like the guys that are a little rougher and rugged. I don't know why, I just do. Um, I like men that you know you cannot cross and that you have to respect. I like men that don't try to get attention but command attention. 
Um, I like the boss. I want the person in the room that is in charge. That's what I'm attracted to. Where do you see yourself in the next couple of years? Um, you know, general five-year plan. Um, right now, I'm really, really focused on my music, um, focused on my acting, um, taking acting classes and going to different workshops and, you know, working with, you know, some different producers and putting together a really dope team. Um, you know, for me, my daughter's not in, like, school school yet, so, you know, she's almost three. So the way I see it, I have two, two and a half years to reach certain goals. Um, if I'm not at a certain place, by then, that's a wrap. I'm not going to be putting my daughter through all these changes and going on the road and being on tour if I've not reached a certain mark. So that is, you know, my deadline. I feel like, yeah, I have, I have my dreams. Everybody has their dreams. And I feel like I am living out a lot of my dreams. But, um, you know, I have not gotten to the level musically that I want to get to. So, you know, I hope that works out. And I'm putting, you know, me and my team are working hard to make that happen. But it's okay to go to sleep and have another dream. You know, people always, I feel like they won't, like, I want this so bad, but I'm not trying to be a SoundCloud artist with a kid in kindergarten. I am a mompreneur, mom, 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 entrepreneur, is that what it is? <laughs> uh, CEO, you know, I, um, it's, I don't put it into one category. You have like Jamie Foxx, you have Drake, you have Nicki Minaj, they're singer, rapper, actor, actress, and they just, they just do it all, you know, and they, and they own it well plus have their other businesses and investments on the side that you may or may not know they have um and you know it's really important to me too that we're teaching our young people about business about investments about these things you know i'm a college dropout that has a five to nine college plan for her two-year-old because my daughter's gonna go to school without having to worry like i did um you know you I already have, you know, my IRAs, my will's done, um, my life insurance is done. Um, you know, you just, you have to, I, I bought my fucking casket. Like, it, we're not teaching these things, you know. You, you, you die and you put your family in debt with your funeral and then you leave them nothing because you don't have life insurance and then they inherit some bullshit because you didn't own shit, you didn't have any net worth, which again, people need to stop Googling net worth. They don't even know what net worth means. Um, you know, I think Jermaine Dupree's net worth online is $2 million. He probably made $2 million last week. You know, people don't understand the difference between working capital and assets and liability and, you know, things like that. And we need to start teaching that. I really think that in high school, we should teach credit. We should teach about paying bills. We, we don't learn that. We train people to be workers. We train people to be middle class. We train people to work for other people. And of course, education is vital. Education is important. But you also have to educate your kids outside of school, outside of the curriculum. The first time they learn about credit should not be when they get a credit card closed because they didn't pay the bill, you know? What advice would you give to you at 18? I think one of the biggest things I would tell my 18-year-old self is um, loyalty has nothing to do with time. It has nothing to do with how long someone's been around. You don't owe anybody anything because you know them. Your associations are so important. Uh, half your friends don't like you. Probably my biggest, biggest advice would be watch your associations, and that's on all levels, business, personal. You know, a lot of times our friends hold us back. Um, and then don't tell people your plan or your dreams or your vision, because they'll try to take it, your dream right out of your head. They'll tell you you can't, oh, it's going to be too hard, oh, it's impossible, because they never tried it, and they don't want you doing better than them. Um, so pretty much keep it to yourself. So TV has obviously played a big success. You know, you've grown your social media to huge numbers. Um, where are you going with this, with social media? You know, social media is awesome, and it's also hard to gauge. Um, I feel like it's better than a commercial. It's better than websites now at this point. Everybody's on social media, so there's tons of opportunity, tons of money to be made. But, you know, as of late, um, a lot of influencers, a lot of people with big following, you know, we're noticing our numbers going down as far as comments, likes, and, and engagement. And Instagram is doing this fishing ban. 
thing where they're hiding you from your followers. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's like IG is, they've noticed how much money we're making as influencers they're not getting a part of. So they're banning you so that you have to pay for ads to be seen by other people. So all these social media people that have figured out, you know, that they think they're celebrities not from not really doing much of anything just by getting all these followers, sometimes real, sometimes fake, it's going to be a little harder to pull it off now. Because, like, when when they find out, oh, they're making what type of money? Let's ban them. So I made a lot of money on social media, and I know I still will. But you cannot have that as your only thing. Like, if, if, if Instagram and Twitter, Snapchat vanished today, what else would you have? And that's why it's so good to have other investments, other businesses, and other things that can still survive. So... It's a great, great, great tool to reach as many people as possible, but who knows how long it's going to last. Think about MySpace. MySpace went away, you know, so we can, you can never plan on one, one media, one outlet. The average millionaire has seven sources of income. So if you're an Instagram model or an influencer, that can't be it. You got to have more. So I want to thank you for coming by. You're one of my favorite people, as you already know. Thanks, Ty. I love you and your family. <laughs> um, how can people find you? Um, super easy at Masika Kalisha. That's my Twitter, my Instagram, my Snapchat, um, M A S I K A K A L Y S H A. You can go to Masika for all of my updates. I have an app available on the app store at Masika Kalisha and that's exclusive content that only my app people get. You get to see things that people don't know behind the scenes. Um, I give a lot of financial advice, tips on investing, and, you know, I talk more one-on-one -on -one with people there. Um, my SoundCloud and my Facebook is King Masika Kalisha, and, of course, you can download all my music on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you stream music. <laughs> Let's, go, Let's go get a drink. It's a wrap. <laughs>